I want to thank everybody, especially the organizers. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. You know, when Ron came back from retirement, and I waited to retire until this is after. So I'm really happy to be here, really enjoying the talks. And uh, should I see if I can advance? But yeah, I want to thank everyone. And um, I have some different names on the title shot here, too. Uh, Scott Balsteck is my colleague at NOAA that's been working with me. And we've also been collaborating with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, with, uh, primarily with Megan McVie and with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game with uh, Sarah Gil Palmer. Uh, there's other individuals as well that have helped out with that. I wanted to recognize that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our Rock Creek Research Station. It's a small uh, experimental hatchery in a fish counting uh, weir or fence. And so I want to talk a little bit about the structure, the kind of data we collect, and then this experiment we've been uh, planning and doing for a few years to look at uh, the relative fitness of hatchery and wild populations in the same small basin. So the study's been funded and initiated by the Pacific Salmon Commission's Northern Fund. Um, uh, one of my other duties is to sit on the Transboundary Rivers uh, Technical Committee uh, that deals with enhancement issues. And uh, as probably most of you guys are aware, there's some large enhancement that goes on on the Taku and the Stikine Rivers, which involves egg takes in Canada, uh, incubation and, and short-term rearing of fry at, at Dipax facility at Snedisham, and then return of these fry to the Canadian lake. So that was one of the reasons is concern over potential impacts on native populations. We want to do things right and, and make sure we're evaluating. Um, Auk Creek gave a platform where we could evaluate in a small system some of these impacts by basically by using parental based tagging methods. So we wanted to do a long term study. We want to be able to estimate individually the fitness of our hatchery and wild crosses. Uh, again, uh, we don't work well without partners. We have to have partners. So we have Alaska Fish and Game again. Uh, DIPAC has been a big help. And the University of Alaska and Fish and Wildlife Service have also been help helpful in terms of operations at the weir and the hatchery and, and conducting this project. So Auk Lake is a small coastal lake. It's just outside of Juneau, Alaska. It's uh, only about a few thousand acres, about 160 foot deep. Um, it has a short outlet stream that leads to saltwater, only about 400 meters. There's a weir just above tidewater that allows us to capture, count, and sample all immigrating and immigrating salmon. So we capture all juveniles and adults as they enter the system. Um, sockeye primarily spawn in the inlet stream if there's adequate flow, which is at the top of the map there called Lake Creek. Um, in recent years, we've had many years where we don't have access to that because of low flows or high temperatures. And in those years, they do uh, spawn in the lake margins, but it's not as uh, good habitat. <clears throat> so we actually have a pretty diverse uh, uh, species composition at Inok Lake. We have pinks, chum, sockeye, coho, belly barred and cutthroat, <clears throat> sculpins and sticklebacks. Uh, just to put a little bit of context, well, I'll wait and get some numbers on those later. Um, so basically, we, uh, we collect all the immigrant fish, all the juveniles that are out migrating. We've had this modern weir installed since 1980. So we've got a pretty good time series now in terms of daily migration data, fitness, productivity information. We actually collect every pink salmon that migrates through, every chum, every sockeye and coho small that leaves. So we have an opportunity to count and sample every fish that either enters or leaves the system. In addition, we can collect environmental data like temperature, water temperature, and flow. And there's been a lot of work done on, on looking at long-term productivity with climate change and changes in timing um, that a lot of the talks this morning have referenced in terms of flow patterns and migration uh, changes in timing of spawning. Um, so we, this is a sort of a shot looking downstream with the, uh, with the small weir in place. There's a series of fan traps and flow dividers um, there's a concrete pad that extends bank to bank and, um, uh, and a, a steel I-beam structure that supports the panels. In the spring, we have like one eighth inch panels because we're capturing pink salmon. I think we may be the only ones counting pink salmon anymore, which I can understand why we get, you know, some years a couple hundred thousand pinks that we're capturing. And of course, every bit of debris or anything that comes down from the lake clogs the screen. So we have the ability to run it as a low head system. There's very little impingement. We have the ability to control water flow and the, the pitch and, and shape of the collection devices. And, and uh, below the weir, there's a trough and a collection uh, area where we separate the fish passively by size. There's, there's some uh, different size troughs. 
So basically, we will install a weir probably this week or next week, and we'll run it in this mode through June, which pretty much covers our smolt season, a uh, fry and smolt season. And again, just to review, we're capturing basically everything that comes through, which provides a lot of experimental control and a lot of ability to monitor, measure, take scale samples, et cetera. This is just a sort of an idealized diagram showing just timing of, of uh, out migration from fry. Pink fry come out maybe mid-April or peaking. Um, the dollies are right behind them, uh, peaking in, in uh, early May. And then in mid-May, you'll get your, your peaks of coho, and then a little later, your peaks on Saka. I, know. I just, I've always liked this graph. It's just kind of, it's very interesting how they segregate their out migration timing. This is just uh, an illustration of the type of data we can collect with sockeye. This is the, the time series that we have looking at just biomass of smolts by age class. And so we've done a lot of work with climate change and there's been some shifts in productivity, but in general, the lake, the coho and the sockeye that are rearing in the lake have shown increased biomass and pretty good resilience in the face of uh, climate change things. We're mostly seeing negative consequences in terms of entry to the lake and, and time <coughs> and, and uh, migration behavior. So about mid-June, um, the smolts are done and we've switched to upgrade systems. So when we go to upgrade and, and, and uh, measure fish coming upstream, we remove all those fine mesh panels and install these heavier <laughs> panels, basically creating a bank-to-bank -bank fence with a single entry point into an adult trap. So you can see the adult trap there in the upper right. It's a pretty large area which can be partitioned off so the fish go in there passively just through a narrowing and a fight, a metal fight. And then they're in, in the adult stream. That actually gives us the ability to get in with the fish, set up our sampling. And so again, we're, we're actually capturing each individual fish, uh, identifying by species, taking our samples, and then passing the fish upstream. So that again allows us to um, to capture everything and control pretty much. We have a pretty high capture efficiency in sampling efficiency going upstream. So just to put some numbers on that, you know, for our pink salmon in a very large year, we'd have 27, 28,000 pink salmon coming into that 400 meter stretch uh, in a bad year, which we've had some bad years lately, more like 600. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of variability in escapements with pinks. Uh, a big year for coho would be 1,000. And then uh, sockeye about 2,500. I think I've got a slide showing the sockeye abundance over time. So again, this gives us a platform for sampling, measuring, collecting genetic.